Today we are starting a new series we're calling Doubt, a series on faith. Doubt, a series on faith. And, and let's face it, doubt is an ugly word, right? Firstly, it's got like a silent B in it, so it kind of doesn't spell right and all of those sort of things there. But, but aside from that, doubt is an ugly word because regardless of where we are on our life journey, at the top of the mountain or barely crawling along in the valley, doubt is very, very real. In fact, it was a great preacher, Charles Spurgeon, who said this. He said, I do not believe there ever existed a Christian who at some point did not now and then doubt his interest in Jesus. In fact, he said, I think when a man says, I never doubt, it is quite time for us to doubt him. That came from the great Charles Spurgeon. Doubt by its very nature of the definition of the word conjures up a feeling of uncertainty. And as such, it, 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 gives, you, it gives you emotions of, of uncomfortableness. I mean, when we think of doubt, we think of doubters, right? And when we think of doubters, we think of negative people. And when we think of negative people, we think of those who are looking at a glass half empty type approach. Not because we don't like them, but because we know that we've been exactly where they've been. And that's half the thing is that we kind of, kind of put it aside because we've all been there. Doubt, to me, conjures up this, these emotions of a little bit of ugliness. Because I kind of, I've had moments of doubt and I kind of don't want to be there again. So when I, when I look at these heroes and when I read Bible characters and I think to myself in their moments of doubt, I think, well, actually, I don't want to be there. Let me give you an example. Let's take Thomas, one of Jesus' apostles. You know the one they call Doubting Thomas? But let's be honest, the other apostles had their moments of doubt. Let me read this to you. John chapter 20, verse 19. That evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors in fear of the Jewish leaders when suddenly Jesus was standing there amongst them. After greeting them, he showed them his hands and his side and how wonderful was their joy as they saw their Lord. Verse 24. One of the disciples, Thomas, the twin, the doubter, was not there at the time with the others. When they kept telling him, we've seen the Lord, we've seen the Lord. And you can imagine what they were. Here's the other 11 disciples and they're like, we've seen the Lord, he's risen, we, we've seen him. Thomas replied, I won't believe it in, until I see the nail wounds in his hands and put my fingers into them and place my hands into his side. Most people who are relatively familiar with the Bible are aware of this passage and, and, and are happy to, to equate the word doubt with Thomas, doubting Thomas. But I wonder if I ask, do you know anything more about the character of Thomas? Whether you'd, you'd know about the time when he showed extraordinary courage, like when it says in the Word, Finally, he, Jesus, said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. Verse 8, but the disciples objected. Rabbi, they said, only a few days ago, the people in Judea were trying to stone you. Are you seriously going to go back there again? Verse 16, Thomas, the same one we call Doubting Thomas, nicknamed the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let's go too, even if we must die with Jesus. 
So here we are, bold, courageous Thomas, but I don't hear anybody ever calling him bold, courageous Thomas. I hear us always going to the negative connotation of doubting Thomas. The reason I want to labor on this just for a little bit is because by calling Thomas a doubter implies that the doubt is directly opposed to faith. And I just want you to take a couple of minutes and set this up. Because when the other disciples said Jesus was risen, Thomas didn't doubt. It says in there, he said straight out, I don't believe. In reality, there are many people who believe but have doubts. In fact, right before Jesus gave the Great Commission and then ascended to heaven, we read in the book of Matthew, it says this, Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. So why don't we say to the eleven disciples, you're all doubters? Yet we, we, we talk about Thomas in the time when he wasn't there, he didn't see Jesus. He said, I won't believe until I see it myself. In just a moment, I'm going to invite a few friends up here on stage because I I felt as we started this series today, Doubt, a series on faith, I wanted to ask three people about three different types of doubt that we may have in our life. A guy called Paul Tillage, who is regarded as one of the greatest theologians of the last century, said this, doubt isn't the opposite of faith, it's an element of faith. Sometimes I think it's my mission to bring faith to the faithless and doubt to the faithful. There is three types of doubt that over the next four to eight weeks or however long we go on this that I want to look at. And the first is this, There's a thing we call intellectual doubt. The struggle with having a faith. And often intellectual doubt will have have questions like, is the Bible really the word of God? Is Jesus truly the son of God? Did he really rise from the dead? Intellectual doubt will go into the creation. Was 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 the world created in six days and was each day 24 hours and and how did it do it and did he do it before lunch and did he have a lunch break and all of these sort of things there. There's also one we call spiritual doubt. This is the one that says, am I really a Christian? Have I truly believed? Why is it so hard to pray? Why do I still feel guilty Why is it taking me so long to get better? This is not about belief. This is saying, I'm believing, I'm speaking to my heavenly father, but I have doubts inside myself, whatever it might be. And the third one is called circumstantial doubt. And this is often the uh, the largest category because it encompasses those, those awkward questions of why in life. Why did this happen to me? Why have I experienced grief? Why did my marriage break up? Why did my my sound investment go bust? Why did I lose my job? Where was God when my uncle was abusing me? These are the questions we meet at the intersection of faith and the pain of living in a fallen world. It's really important that we get this. There is an intersection that we can come to. We can have faith and we can still doubt. It's written in the Bible that Thomas was the doubting Thomas. But we'll get to the end of the scripture with him in a moment. What I want you to do is I want you to welcome up onto stage Sev, Raj, and fudge. Would you guys come on up? (laughs) 
Yeah, come on, let's give these guys a round of applause. It's all right, I'll grab, you. I'll grab your mic, Fudge, it's all right, man. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. You can have it first, you're the lady. Hello. <laughs> Alrighty, I'm going to look too tall up here, aren't I? Yep. Should I speak ne sit next to Raj? Yep. I'm going to sit next to Raj. Yep. Is that alright? That sounds good. <laughs> Cameraman, is that okay? So you're Fudge. Hi Fudge. I'm just going to hang out with Raj for a little bit. <laughs> this is Raj. How are you Raj? I'm good, thank you. Very cold inside. <laughs> Very cold inside. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. He's saying that because he's sitting next to me. Uh, nice. <laughs> Fudge, how are you? You got a mic next to you. You got to use a mic. Oh. Yes. I'm very good. <laughs> Sev? I'm really good. Just need a strong latte. Just need a strong we latte. Typical Italian. <laughs> Let me start with you, Sev. Yep. The reason I got you up here is because you're kind of a little bit of, since I've known you, I would see you as a foundationally strong, biblically based, Jesus-centered, spirit-led woman of God. Wow. Okay. Amen. <laughs> Let me ask you, though, do you have moments of doubting? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I was really thinking about this deeply, and one of the big areas that I do have doubts is my ability to be the best mum. And I think that's because it's a huge thing. Being a mum is a real privilege. And I just remember the times at night when I'd sit next to the bed and the kids, you know, telling them stories and, you know, you're, you're reading Bible stories and you're just, you're putting into them what you believe, you know. and. I remember saying, you know, God, you have said that if we raise up our children in the way they should go, they'll not depart from this, from you. And every now and then I go, really? Because I can't see it. Sometimes through these moments where, you know, the tears that I've had at night praying over my kids, you know, I don't, I can't see, I can't see where they're going to end up. I trust in God that they will end up where God wants them to be, but I'm not in control of that. And that's where I doubt as a mum because I think, you know, I mean, look, the times when they were toddlers and I'm in the closet, in the cupboard, finding chocolate because I'm thinking, I just feel like killing them. You know, like, and I would never do that. Like, she didn't actually do it. It's okay. No, I didn't. They're, they're yeah. beautiful. They're teenagers now. They're, they're, teen they're gorgeous. Um, you know, and times where, you know, you think your son, like, he was a biter. You know, my son, a biter. Like, and I'm going, God, how, like, is this a test? Like, you know... Seriously, you know, I would have moments of doubt in that because that's a huge thing. You know, I wouldn't hurt a... F well, actually, I would hurt a fly, but I wouldn't hurt a human. And when you're out at these places, you know, kinder gym, and you've got like 100 metres between you and the kid that your child's about to go for, and you have parents staring at you, and they know you're a Christian, you're the best mum that they have met, you know, you're chatting to them about that... I have my doubts and I think, well, you know, but it's, it's not, I'm not in control of that, God is. And it's when I start to lean on my own understanding. So, you know, in Proverbs 3, 5, that's a big one for me, you know, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. He will get them to the finish line. I'm here to kind of help them along the way and I have doubts in myself as a mum because I do stuff up and I do make mistakes. I do apologise to my kids when I'm grumpy and hangry, apparently, is the new thing where you need to eat, so, you, you know. So let me ask this then. <laughs> you, you, I think every parent out there would be nodding their head saying, yep, I'm with you in this one. Yeah. How do you, do, what do you do, what do you say to God in these situations when, when you maybe see, your kids are teenagers now, when you maybe see them uh, not responding the way you totally want to do, you know, do, does this become a thing where you start actually questioning God? That's a 
good question. That's why I asked it. I know. <laughs> yes, it does become a thing where I question God because, because I, I see things visually, like I'm a, you know, I see things in pictures and I see things in the future. So for years I have seen my kids where I think that they're going to be perfectly placed here and there and, and whatnot. And when they are doing things that I know that they want to do, yet in my heart I go, is that going to get them to where they need to be, God? I do have doubts in that and I do say, God, it, it, I guess it's the question, why? Why is this happening right now? because I didn't see this coming, and how are they going to get to a place where they need to be with you? Yep. Awesome. I want you to pass it over to Fudge for a second. For those who don't know, this is Fudge Jordan. Fudge has, uh, or still is, leads um, a youth ministry around this town. He devotes his life, along with his wife Tanya, to leading a youth ministry looking after our kids in this city. Uh, I admire what you do, Fudge, and I say thank you for what you're doing for the kids in this city. Thanks. Fudge, I've had the opportunity to have a couple of coffees with you, and you were sharing with me the time when in uh, the beautiful black town in Sydney, where uh, I was a paramedic as well, but before the time you were up, Sorry, after the time you were, you were the situation we're going to speak about. But uh, you were on your motorbike, is this right? Yes. Yes? Riding along, having a nice cruise. And uh, got hit by a car. Yeah, I had a car run a red light and just um, cleaned me up. And this was not just an uh, ordinary type situation. You were pretty seriously injured. Yeah, I mean, I lost, I've lost the use of my left, left arm, so the, the nerves got pulled from the spinal cord. Um, I, I was lucky to survive. The passenger in the other car didn't survive. So, yeah, I was actually lucky to um, do Superman over the car and uh, just land on the other side and not suddenly come to a stop. So, Fudge, at the time, uh, did, did you have a faith in, in Jesus? Oh, very much so, yeah. Um, I came to faith when I was about 14 years old, so I didn't come from a Christian upbringing, but uh, I came to faith through a school-based ministry, actually. So you were 18, 19 when this happened? A little bit older? Uh, 25. 25? Yes. I was trying to give you back a few years. I know, no? 25. So at 25, you've been, you've been a, a Jesus follower for 10 years, uh, you were a type of guy who was already serving in ministry, doing these type of things. When you were laying in hospital bed there, thinking to yourself, and when they're saying to you, your nerves have been pulled from your spinal cord, you will have no feeling in your left arm again. Tell us what was going through your mind. Um, I suppose I don't remember it at that time, because, you know, those first days are always a bit foggy when you're on so much drugs, I suppose. Um... But I do know, and um, I was in the emergency for about, I don't know, six hours before my wife turned up, because they ring her up and say, oh, your, your husband's had a little accident, just pop down to the emergency sometime. And she says, oh, when I'm finished work, I'll come down and see him. <laughs> they don't want to freak you out and have you rush there and have another accident. So she comes in, and the nurses say, um, oh, your, your husband's, I don't know what language he's speaking, he's very angry, he's just yelling. And she comes in, and they say, oh, don't worry, he's just praying in tongues. So... Like, at that point, I had no remember, but from that point, for that six hours, she said, I was shouting down the uh, emergency ward, um, just praying. Um, but my faith has never been rocked in the sense that God didn't cause the accident. Um, the other lady who was in the car didn't cause the accident. I've run a red light myself. Um, lucky I haven't killed anybody. It was actually her mum that died in the accident. So accidents just happen. God didn't cause it. God's not keeping me in a crippled state just so he can use me in ministry as a great testimony. Um, God's desire for me is to be fully restored like each and every one of us. We are just living in a place where um, his will is not always carried out. We are living in a place where um, he has intention. Nothing happens. I mean, people say God's will was always carried out. I disagree with that in the sense that God's will is for none shall perish. And 
we obviously know people do. He allows things to happen because he's given us free choice. So there's no remorse, thinking, ah, oh, God's not with me. God is definitely with us. He's, I run to him in times of trouble. Uh, when things go bad, that's when I know I need God. Wow. So how do you, how do you encourage us when we've got the man flu or the sniffles and we start, you know, complaining to God about these things of why me, when, you know, I'm sure you love the use of your left arm. Um, I, the, a couple of lessons I have learnt. Um, I'm, I, I've always been appreciative of things. I look for the positive in things. I'm, I'm a glass half full. But I have been appreciative in the sense that um, I've never lost my mental capacity and my emotions is I know where I stand. Um, for people who start doubting their own beliefs or faith or themselves, um, I've never experienced that, so I don't know what that's like. So I think that would be much harder for people to live with mental um, um, capacity to try and understand all that, because I know where I stand. I can live with physical pain. It's difficult sometimes. I'm in pain 24-7. It never stops. But I can cope with that because I know who I am and I know where God is standing um, in me. Um, one of the darkest times in my life was probably that first Christmas after the accident. It was only two months after the accident. Um, for six months, I lived in a, in a fetal position in my bed. I was taking 40 pain tablets a day just to get through the day. Um, my wife said she never saw my eyes for about six months. Um, I was just curled up in a ball for six months in a bed, um, just coping with physical pain. Um, so two months in, Christmas Day, um, my wife's having Christmas at our house with her family. They're having a good time and, and I'm just in my pain crying. I just can't stand this. And I start thinking about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he's saying, he's crying out to the Father saying, take this cup from me. You know, so I start, I start praying that prayer myself. I say, Father, I can't take this. My cup is overfilling. I need you to take this cup from me. Clear as day. The only time I've ever heard God's voice speak to me, he said to me, some cups are bigger than others. Wow. You know, and I go, you know, what does that mean to you? What does it mean to me? For me, it means that some cups are bigger. He's created us different and he will allow us. Um, he's created us that he will endure, make sure we endure everything he has thrown at us. So, yeah, we all have different cups to carry. Um, but he will never allow our cup to overflow if we rely upon him. Wow. So that verse has probably kept me going for 20 years. I'm going to... Yeah, awesome. <laughs> Fudge, and, and don't worry, I'm going to get to you, Raj. Just you, just you hold on. Fudge, and then, Sev, you can answer this too. A really interesting conversation I had with, with Fudge when I was, I was sort of planning with this. Um, I, just, I really felt to, to hear his that the people need to hear his testimony. And he actually said something to me which surprised me a little bit uh, in the fact that you said the times potentially when you feel away from God is actually when everything in life is going really, really cruisy. Mm. Um, very logically thinking, um, I know the tough times I run to God and I always think about you know, having doubt when to, what would make me lose my faith. And I have concluded the only thing that will lose my faith is apathy. So when I think life is good and I don't need God, I think that's when a lot of people st stray away from him. When they don't need God, they go, I can do life without him. But um, when tough, tough times come, I need God. So apathy, I think, is probably the biggest fear I would have of actually if that came into my life. And I have to be wary of to I'd never be apathy about God. What about you, Sev? The, the word that comes to mind is complacency for me because there was a real thing in my life where I did become complacent and um, I believed in God but I wasn't involved really anywhere. It, like I came to church but I just kind of stopped doing the things that um, I love to do like having people over and, you know, spending time and talking to them about God and that complacency was scary because... 
it was like I wasn't hot or cold. I was kind of that lukewarmy thing and it was horrible. Um, and I just thank God a friend called me and said, hey, you said you're going to be at church, not checking up on you, but are you okay? I just burst out crying, let it all out, and that was it. From that point on, it was, okay, God, what is it that you, you want me to do? What, what is my purpose here? What is the top thing on my list that I need to do? And I love you and I love people. And that's what I started focusing on once again is loving people. And from there, it's been... A journey as well. So, yep. so Sev, one what, quick last one with you in this. I've, I've heard your your salvation story, yep. and and you told me that 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 when you found Jesus in your life, that, that when you accepted Christ into your life, mm -hmm. you were hungry. Yep. You had spiritual doubts because you didn't know, yep. but you were hungry. Mm -hmm. You know, when you talk about that complacency, how do we how do we maintain that 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 hunger for God in our lives? You main, I, I would maintain it is being around the people that are strong in God, praying, never stop praying, just continue to pray and to step out. It is stepping out in faith. It's stepping out in the unknown and going, okay, I can't see it, but I'm just going to keep walking this. It's coming to church when I don't feel like coming to church. Because I know that God will speak to That's me. Good. And if he doesn't, he'll speak to someone else or he'll use me to speak to someone else. So it's not, and that's what I've often said to you, it's not what I feel, it's what I know. Because sometimes good. I feel nothing, but I know that he's there. I'm going to get, sorry, bud, I'm going to get all emotional. Have you got a tissue? Um, <laughs> have you got a tissue? You haven't got a tissue. You need a girl on the couch. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thanks, Tom. Um... And it's also not just what you know, it's what you believe. Yeah. You know, because you can know a lot of things, but the Bible says it's foolishness to those that don't believe. So the doubts that I have isn't because I don't believe. Because if I didn't believe something, then there's no point having doubts because I don't believe it. You know, why would That's I have great. doubts for something that I don't believe? But it's because I believe in it so much that those doubts do come because I'm human I'm not perfect, I never will be, but I know, I know and I believe that God is there. So, it's great when I'm feeling good, but when I'm not feeling good, I go to what I know, which is the Word of God, I know. I go to the stories and the testimonies that I know when God showed up in my life, that you can't deny the awesome. testimonies that we have, we can't deny that, and I believe Come on, yeah. come on. Amen. On the way through to Raj, tell me, tell me, Fudge, how do you mentally, how do you break through that, that apathy, the word you use, that apathy to make sure that, uh, you know, you don't become lukewarm? Uh, I've always kept active and I suppose um, always doing um, mission stuff in my backyard with teens. I've always needed God. I, it's like stepping on that ledge. I've never i've grown in my own faith by having to be out there on the edge all, all, all my life um but to combat the apathy i suppose when dark times come and uh, it was advice given to me um before i got married and he says when you're taking your wife remember you married you're gonna have dark days but remember this day you're making this commitment when the sun is shining on a good day when so the dark days come Remember that you made this decision on a good day. I met God on a great day. God has had many sunshine in my life. So when the dark and the clouds come, I go, don't, di don't doubt yourself because the clouds are there. Remember that the sun is shining and uh, it was good. Wow. Come on. Come on. <laughs> no, no, you can pick it up, Raj. Huh? So Raj Chopra. And his beautiful wife, Silky, down there and their little child's out in uh, kids' church somewhere. Yeah. Raj, you were born and bred in India in a, to a, a Hinduism family, yet uh, you sit here now as a Jesus follower. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, um, it has been a very amazing journey since we moved uh, to Australia. So we moved here in 2013 
uh, from Delhi directly to Hobart. There was a bit of a culture shock, 5 million people to 50,000. Um, and, you know, we actually thought that's a blessing for us because we were trying to run away from the traffic and hot weather uh, in Delhi. Uh, and, you know, the journey uh, which we had, I mean, from day one, uh, we met someone uh, in the coals, and that lady invited us to a prayer meeting of some people who were doing in Migrant Resource Center. We went because we just wanted to meet some people. And, you know, it, uh, it was quite, you know, uh, suspenseful or doubtful for us to look, you know, people were praying and there was nothing there. There was no idols, there was no temple, and people were putting the Bible on the floor. So it was, you know, we were thinking, you know, how come, you know, the thing which you have to worship, you're putting on the floor. And, you know, it, it took uh, at least six months and we kept on going until we actually came to understand. Uh, I mean, I came uh, to know Jesus in my house one day um, after reading Bible, which was given to us on first day, and we put that in our temple, and we used to worship the Bible at that time. We didn't even have to read it. Uh, we were not taught uh, that you actually read the scriptures. You are always told by someone. Uh, I, I mean, the biggest thing, if you talk about doubt, is, you know, for me personally, it was that how is it so simple that God can actually forgive you and accept you in his, you know, eternity? without doing any ritual, without following any traditions, without, you know, doing certain things that we were used to do. So, you know, that's, and that how simple, uh, when, the, when you try to uh, understand the simplicity, it becomes very doubtful. Uh, other people think, so is that it? You just stand and somebody prays and God forgives you. How, how does that happen? You know, we have walked, uh, to different temples and shrines and donated money and fasted and didn't eat meat on a Tuesday, don't cut your nails on Thursday and different things. Seriously? Uh, and absolutely. So, uh, and that's what, you know, when uh, my parents heard about and they thought that because I have to live in Australia, I have to become a Christian. Uh, they didn't understand that. Um, a lot of my friends thought that I've gone a little bit crazy in my mind, and I just couldn't do anything after, you know, Christ came into my life. Uh, my parents still think, uh, you know, that I'm Christian uh, by force, uh, as Australians have forced us uh, to become Christian, uh, but you haven't. Uh, <laughs> let, me, let me ask you one, Raj, um, amazing story. Amazing story. When, when your whole life from the day you're, you're, you're born is, is around worshipping idols and then, then the whole thing of what we do is a step of faith. It's so different. So different to what we think. But Raj, you've, you've as many of us do, you've sh cried, you've, you've prayed, you've showed concern for your parents because... Uh, you know what it's like to be a Jesus follower now. And you, as many of us do here, it doesn't have to be because they're following another religion, but you cry for your parents. Tell us the story of, of the, the carer that's helping out with your, um, with your parents. I mean, since, since I came to faith, you know, one of the biggest doubts that I had in my mind that how will my family come to know Christ? They're so far away. They're uh, still in Delhi. So they're still in, yeah. uh, I mean, 100 kilometers from Delhi. It's Delhi. Yeah, yeah, we can call it Delhi. So, you know, there was always a doubt that I'm not there and I tried on phone and, you know, we couldn't uh, understand that what will happen. And me and my wife discussed that many times. Uh, three, four months back, uh, you know, uh, my father went uh, really sick, and last month he had a stroke. Uh, so I had to go back to India quickly. I, you know, went for 10 days. And when I went there, uh, one evening I was sitting, my mom also fell, you know, in the same month, and she broke her hip. Uh, so she required 24-hour care. My father required 24-hour care. And when I walked in, you know, I looked at the temple inside the house and other things. And I was like, God, you know, it, I need something that you help me. And on the night when I was sitting next to my uh, parents, uh, father was sleeping and my mother said, you know the girl who comes in the night, she actually prays for us sometimes. 
And, and I said, what kind of prayer? Uh, I, I think you don't need uh, those prayers. You know, we pray for you. And she said, I don't know. You know, she said, and we said, yes. So I said, okay, I'll meet her. When she came in the evening, she's uh, from a local area uh, near our house, which is kind of a slums, uh, very poor and very dominated by, you know, um, uh, local religious groups where if you do follow Christ, you are called Christian converter uh, and people don't go near your house and not have nothing to do with you. And she came along and I asked her, I said, so what did you pray for my parents? Don't they have enough uh, prayer already with idols and stuff? And she said, you know, Jesus is the biggest healer. Come on. A and, Come on. and I looked at her. And I said, sorry, what did you say? And she said, Jesus is the biggest healer. And, I, and she said, you know, I used to know, uh, and, and she said there, were two, there are two gods, one that wanted to kill me and one that saved me, and I wanted to bring that to your parents. And I was literally amazed, and she spoke for half an hour about her testimony, how, you know, she threw all the idols out of her house, came to know Jesus through revelation, and now there are 25 people in her prayer meeting group, and she's, you know... Uh, and she said to me, and she said, look, I, when I go to any house, I don't actually care what they think. I tell them that I'm going to read Bible for one hour. If they say no, I walk off because Jesus said, you know, wipe your dust off your feet as wow. well. And, and I was like, wow. She was so powerful evangelist. And I, just, I was just blown away listening to her testimony that how... And she said, I will continue to pray for them. And she said, you know, the biggest thing I felt in this house when I came, that people usually uh, go in opposition, but nobody opposed me here. My uncle is living there, some other people. And she said, nobody opposed me. And I was like, you know, that was a relieving moment for me. And there was a faith moment that what we were doubting, God has actually heard our prayers and Come brought on. someone there. Come on. The prayer of a son. The prayer of a son. I reckon we could listen to these guys all day, couldn't we? But I want you to give them a huge round of applause. Fantastic. Thank you, guys. As we conclude, as these guys are getting down and the, guy, and the musos get up, I want to briefly turn back to uh, our friend Doubting Thomas. Because when Jesus returned to the house eight days later, this time Thomas was there. And Jesus made a specific beeline for where Thomas was. Eight days earlier, he had been there with his guys. That's all right, just leave that one. And at this time, he makes a beeline for Thomas. And he said to him, don't fear, don't doubt, peace be with you, I am who I say I am. And I love what Thomas says back to him, courageous, bold Thomas. I love what he says back to Jesus. He says, my Lord and my God. This was not astonishment of like, oh my God. This was my Lord, my God. Doubt is not sinful and wrong. In fact, I believe that doubt can be the catalyst to spiritual growth in our life. You probably didn't think I was going to say that coming to church this morning. But that's why we've called this doubt a series on faith. Because I truly believe that moments in life, and you heard that these three, three people up here, that, that doubt can be this, this catalyst for this spiritual growth that occurs in us. For Thomas, as he saw Jesus, he says, My Lord, my God. As fudge as he's laying in the emergency room, doesn't even know it, but he's, he's, he's speaking in tongues. 
Raj is praying for, for his parents. And little does he know it, a carer, a woman from the slums, starts praying for her parents and is holding a connect group in the slums with 25 people. God hears us, people. God hears us. He knows our doubts. He knows our agony. He knows with Sev, when you're praying for your children, praying for your parents, praying for your next door neighbour, when you're praying for healing, God knows these things. I'm going to ask each person just to, where you are, remain seated and to just close your eyes. I'm going to finish with a quote that I sourced by a guy simply known as Jackson. And then I'm going to read a scripture from Isaiah 41. You see, I don't see a God who turns away honest doubters. In fact, in Jude's letter, we read where he says, Be merciful to those who doubt. But as all eyes are closed, and as I read this quote, I'm going to ask that if you want to get right with God, if you want to ask Him to help you with, with your areas of doubt, then as the eyes are closed, we've got our pastoral care team are around. I'm going to ask you as I, as I read this quote and then just read a scripture to raise your hand so that our pastoral care team can see you and that they can come after the service and pray with you and spend time with you. Because often when it's moments of doubt, we can't do it by ourselves. That's why we doubt. And so sometimes it takes a pastoral care person just to be with you, to hear you, to love with you, to, to pray with you. I'm going to read this quote. Then I'm going to read a scripture. Just where you are as all eyes are closed. If doubt is overtaking your life and you want to say, God, I need help in this. I want you just where you are, raise your hand. Someone will see you. Jackson said this. Life includes a lot of unsolved mystery. Filled with moments of confusion and times of doubt. Yet to stand firm in your faith means having the capacity to say, but even if he doesn't, I will worship my God. As the hands keep going up around the place, just keep them up for just a little bit longer. Just keep them up just a little bit longer as they keep going up around the place. Thank you. He goes on to say, faith is one human characteristic that does not allow for compromise. That is, either one possesses it or one does not. And despite the doubts that may arise as a result of the journey called life, those who put faith in Christ, despite not knowing all the answers, can and will declare, hallelujah, you have overcome. Jesus, you have overcome the world. Just keeping those hands up. I'm just going to read a scripture out of Isaiah. The pastoral care team can see your hands. They're going to come and see you in a moment. Just keep them up. I'm just going to read this scripture out of Isaiah. It says this. It says, I have called you back from the ends of the earth, saying, you are my servant, for I have chosen you and I will not throw you away. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. Do not be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and I will help you. I will hold you up with my righteous, victorious hand. For I hold you by my right hand. I, the Lord your God, and I say to you, do not be afraid. I am here to help you. Heavenly Father, I just pray as those hands are being raised right across this place, just where you are, raise them right up. If you want to say, you know what, God, I'm just tired of this doubt. I need someone to speak to. I want to get right with you in this space. 
just raise your hand where you are. Our pastoral care team will come and speak with you. We're going to sing a song to finish. But just just where you are, I'm going to finish in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the testimonies we've just heard. I thank you, Lord God, that at the moments of doubt in our life can actually be a catalyst of where we can increase our faith in you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for what you are doing in the lives of people here. I pray for those hands that have arisen right across this place. We thank you for those hands. That Lord God, today will be a moment when they can hand over some of those things to you. Lord God, that they can hand over to you, Heavenly Father, those things that may be holding them back. And they may declare that you are victorious, Lord God, and that you will overcome. In your mighty name, in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Let's all stand. We're going to finish. We're going to finish.